Hanging half a hundred out of Minoan Field. Or the run rules on the Diamond at Love's Field. We're giving you the breakdowns, the bets, and the hot takes from the perspective of two former OU Athletics employees. You're listening to the Mainline Podcast with Tyler Burton and Adam Jaquez. Let's go! Let's go! Go! Let's go. It's the Mainline Podcast. He's Tyler Burton. I'm Adam Jacquez. We appreciate everyone making the Mainline a part of your daily or weekly routine here. Tyler, what are we talking about this evening? Got a jam-packed show tonight, Adam. Obviously, we uh, talked a little about some guys on the offensive side of the football last week. Now we're going to flip it over to the defensive side of the things. Brent Venable's crew talk about some guys that are standing out so far over the course of spring practice we're going to talk about Jenny Baranchek's crew uh coming up one game short of the sweet 16 fantastic season by Jenny's bunch uh we're going to talk a little bit about diamond sports another phenomenal weekend for OU softball baseball kind of comes back down to earth a little bit we'll get to Adam's uh, take on that here towards the end of the episode but Adam spring football is fully underway the social media content we're kind of getting a little bit of the the snippets they're teasing us a little bit with some of the highlights that they're putting out on social media but make no mistake about it football time in oklahoma springtime let's go yeah absolutely and we saw that uh, i know everyone saw the highlight jackson arnold to bauer sharp we talked about bauer sharp here on the show a week ago so maybe we will manifest another player tonight on the defensive side of the ball and maybe we see a highlight there um it's a fun time of year it's it's wild it's speculation it's um, guys that shine that have tons of buzz about them right now and some of them really pan out in the fall and some of them just totally disappear so it's it's a wild time it's exciting and uh, I think I'm, I'm pumped to talk about some of the defensive side of uh, of the ball here and some of the guys I think probably a good place to start is is Woody Washington and we've heard some buzz about him throughout the spring he's a guy that has the most experience of anyone in that secondary right now he's one that I think was a little surprising that he actually returned to Oklahoma because I wasn't sure that his draft stock could necessarily get any higher than it was currently, but it sounds like he's looking at some different ways to be creative and really add to his resume this season in Norman. Yeah. In a secondary, that's probably the deepest that we've seen since Brent Venables first, you know, first time as a coach here at the university of Oklahoma, the secondary as deep as it is, it's really allowed Woody Washington, you know, not just the ability to come back, but it's really giving him an opportunity to maybe slide inside a little bit, play, play a little bit more of that nickel corner type position from everything you know that, that we've heard with some of the things that are going on in practice so far Woody Washington is playing at least three positions in that Oklahoma secondary uh, over the course of the first couple of weeks of spring practice so you know you're you're able to do a lot of those things Adam when you're able to recruit extremely well you're able to bring in some really solid depth pieces behind him and you really can't even consider a depth now when you look at what Oklahoma already has in Gentry Williams you talk about Josiah Wagner McCarty Vickers Des Malone who we'll talk about here here in just a second jacoby johnson is another one as well when you're able to bring in four or five six guys that are you know those prototypical uh sec type cornerbacks then you're able to do a lot of different things with what you're able to figure out a way to get your best 11 guys on the field at all times and so we know that they're doing a lot of fun creative things with woody in that secondary it's gonna be it's gonna be very interesting as we kind of watch this season play out depending on who the opponent is that week the matchup facing that offense you're gonna see woody washington playing a couple different positions across that Oklahoma secondary but from everything that we've heard he's taking to it nicely I like that and I also think it's interesting because whether it's something where he moves into that nickel role for all downs or if it's just on third down or or what the situation might be it opens up a lot of reps at that cornerback position for somebody else is that more playing time for Kendall Dolby because Cheetah is filled with Justin Harrington or is it someone like Jacoby Johnson or Makari Vickers who comes in? Or is it a transfer like Des Malone or someone like Connie Walker who, you know, we haven't talked as much about, but he's nope. flashing the moments. There's just, there's a lot of guys there that you're like, okay, how do we get the best 11 guys out on the field there? And I think there's a lot of interesting ways you could go with that. I think you also put into the picture of just the overall third down defense of what this could look like. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the guys on maybe the the linebacker or or defensive line position that things could change up. You have different looks, but I wonder how much the change in the in-helmet communication system causes teams to be a little bit slower in their pace. Maybe they huddle more often. And does that allow actually the perfect timing for OU to start going crazy with their third down packages because you can substitute a lot more guys in and out if the offense is going to go slower? Anytime that you're really ever to have quality depth across both the safety, the nickel corner, 
and the you know the regular cornerback position. It allows a guy like Zach Alley and Brent Venables to get very creative, finding different ways to attack opposing offenses, finding out a way to get your best guys. You know, depending on the situation. You know, Adam, we heard us. You know, we uh, we got a text from us from a source the other day. Zach Alley's he's kind of um, kind of got a formation going on right now. He's got a third down package where he's actually got four. Uh, or excuse me, he's got three edge guys uh, out there on the line of scrimmage. Danny Stutzman at linebacker, and then he's got seven defensive backs uh, out there on the secondary. So again, when you've got that much talent, when you're able to recruit the way that Jay Valai and Brandon Hall and Brent Venables have been able to do so for the last two or three classes, you know, you, you're it's not going to be um, you know an uncommon thing to look out there on Saturdays and see five to six defensive backs on the field for Oklahoma, uh, led by Danny Stutzman. So again, we talked about Woody Washington, another couple of guys in the secondary that are continuing to make waves des malone the cornerback transfer from san diego state who you know carrie murdoch put that picture out there yesterday of what he looked like in an oklahoma uniform uh, he's exactly what you're looking for in the sec when you talk about some of the some of the wide receivers that oklahoma is going to be playing against uh in the sec next year you've got to have those you know those big body big frame long rangy corners out there on the edge we know that oklahoma's got that with the healthy gentry williams and it seems like Oklahoma has found another piece to add to the uh, to the cornerback position as well in Des Malone, who looks phenomenal. He's already flashing over the course of spring practice. And again, Jacoby Johnson, you know, home, you know, home state kid. This is a guy that's came in. He, he's been part of this program now for you know well over a year now. He's you know had the opportunity to kind of grow accustomed to what it's like playing you know power forward Division One football. He's transformed his body. The game's slowing down a little bit for him. Jacoby Johnson is a guy that we're hearing as well. He's made his fair share of plays down the field as well. And this really kind of puts Adam J. Valai in kind of a I don't want to necessarily say a tough position because you would much rather have five or six guys that can play instead of just one or two, and then you're having to figure out, okay, well, how do we get by if one or two of them go down? Make no mistake about it. With what Des Malone, Jacoby Johnson have brought to the table uh, here over the course of the offseason through the first couple of weeks of spring practice, that cornerback position looks very, very strong for Oklahoma going into this season. Key Lawrence was a guy last year that filled out that number 12 jersey really well. One of the better looking defensive backs just in the uniform, uh, maybe not all the time in, in his play. He certainly had some flashes as a Sooner, but uh, yeah. Des Malone looks even better in that number 12. Yeah. Um, the the picture we're referencing is, is from Kerry Murdoch's Twitter. If anyone wants to check that out, if you haven't seen it already, but yeah, that's a cornerback. I mean, he looks better than Key Lawrence did as a safety. So that's that's saying something. So I think there's I think there's a lot of guys, and we haven't even mentioned uh, Jocelyn Malaska, the Utah transfer from yeah. uh, from Bethany, and he's a guy that I think a lot of people are really interested in. We haven't mentioned Josiah Wagner, who had a ton of buzz last preseason before some mm-hmm. injuries kind of slowed him down. I think there was a lot of chatter that he might be a number two on the depth chart uh, going into last fall. So he's still around. There's there's just there's so many Mac- options. Macari there Vickers. Are, <laughs> yeah, there's there's so many options that are super interesting here, and. I, I love that, you know, with Woody Washington going into some other positions, it's just going to open up more playing time for those guys, get them comfortable so that they're feeling confident when Woody is completely gone, that we can go, okay, 2025 season, we've got some guys that are seasoned, uh, ready to produce, or even like Gentry Williams, if he has a great year, he might be an NFL draft pick over at the sure. other corner. Or if he experiences more of the injury bug, I feel like you're going to have more guys that are ready to, to pick up the slack there. Yeah, I think you make a really good point, and Adam, let's transition to a different position on this side of the ball, the the linebacker position. You know, obviously, all the talk is going to be about Danny Stutzman, rightfully so. Anytime that you're, you know, you're a a Butkus, you know, you know, front runner going into this upcoming season, you know, you've he's got all the accolades, and you know, uh, give the man credit where credits due. But Kip Lewis is another one where we talked about it, Adam, over the last couple of weeks, where you know the the off season, the winter workout period was going to be absolutely critical for Kip Lewis because he was playing last. Last year kind of around that 195 to 200 pound range and you know was extremely effective in all that he was able to do as you see on the highlights here uh texas unable to get in for four consecutive downs but we've talked about the fact that kip lewis is now up there at 215 pounds hopefully by kickoff you know in the month of september you're going to maybe see uh kip maybe around that 220 to 222 range playing inside linebacker in the sec you've got to you've got to be a little bit more uh, bulky for lack of a better term, but make no mistake about it. Kip Lewis, even though he is about seven to eight pounds heavier than we saw, uh, you know, in the final game uh, down in San Antonio, he still kept all the speed. He still, you know, has kept that acceleration, that burst, the agility. And Kip Lewis is a guy who, you know, make no mistake about it. Danny Stutzman is going to get all the accolades and rightfully so, 
But don't be surprised if you look up here about halfway through the season, you see Kip Lewis is really, you know, kind of being, you know, that alpha dog in that linebacker core because Kip's Kip's one hell of a player. He's building on another, uh, you know, what, what was a fantastic back half of last season. And Zach Alley and Brent Venables are extremely excited about what they're seeing from Kip. Yeah, and I, I feel like as, as excited as we are about Kip, I still feel really good about Jaron Kanick. I know some Absolutely. people are kind of down on him, but I, I think you know that's a young player that hadn't played the linebacker position a ton, and I thought he had still a lot of really good moments in that OU uniform. Like The best defense of the year that OU played, Jaron Kanick was contributing to some of that. He was detracting from some of that, but he was learning the position still. Mm -hmm. And I feel like he's got a lot to still contribute, even if Kip Lewis is, is considered the starter. I think the same thing about Kobe McKenzie. And then there's guys at third and fourth string that we still feel good about as well. So, um, I, I mean, it's another position group on this defense where you just feel like, man, like how are we going to get enough playing time for all these different guys that we all mm -hmm. think are talented? We've seen them prove some stuff on the field. And it's like, man, there's just not enough snaps to go around uh, in some ways. Yeah, I know that there's been a lot of maybe backstepping a little bit on Jaron Canick's, you know, performance and what, you know, the rest of his career kind of projects. So you're not going to find any of that slander on this podcast. We're extremely excited about what Seven's going to be able to do. And then you look at a guy like, you know, guys like Kobe McKenzie and Lewis Carter, you know, very rarely, Adam, over the course of a college football season, when you look at all 22 positions, you never, ever run into a situation where you're able to stay 100% healthy over the course of an entire regular season. So you've got to have that quality depth at all of those positions, especially at the linebacking position. As going into the SEC, a lot of the offenses that are running there, sure, you've got, you know, you've got a handful of offenses that Oklahoma is going to be going up against this year, like an Ole Miss or Tennessee, where they're going to try to spread you out. But every single team that Oklahoma is going to face does have the ability to line up you know whether it's in you know 12 personnel 21 personnel and really kind of pound the rock so you've got to be deep you've got to be talented at the linebacking position and uh you know whether it's kip danny jaron uh kobe or lewis uh oklahoma's got a lot of good quality depth it's gonna be fun to watch how these guys are utilized and how they get them on the field Someone that is a little bit newer to Oklahoma is Caden Woolard, and we've heard some buzz about him here in the spring already. He's a guy that Oklahoma desperately needs to have uh, some high-level production out of. Caden Woolard out of Miami of Ohio was uh, really fantastic for the Red Hawks last year, and we're starting to hear a lot about that buzz uh, here in spring practice. He's a guy that I think OU will want to lean on both from senior leadership, but also just a high level of production at a defense in the Mac that was really good last year. So I think mm -hmm. you can take a lot out of what you're hearing out of those reports of him doing really well and providing that spark. And maybe he's a guy that, um, you know, is a little bit further along than maybe a PJ or an R Mason Thomas. And maybe he can at least, you know, keep things at a really high level until those guys really are ready to produce, whether that be this year, next year, who knows. Um, but I think he's one that you're really excited to hear about as a Sooner fan, because you know, he's proven his track record as a pass rusher. 1,000%, Adam, and I know that many people are going to look and say, okay, he's a transfer from Miami of Ohio. It's Miami of Ohio. How well could that possibly translate going into the SEC? But, you know, I would encourage people, you know, that are paying attention to the NFL draft, you know, coming up here in about a month or so. There's going to be two defensive linemen from Florida State that are going to go probably within the first 60 picks. Both of those guys were transfers from non-Power 4 programs. So just because you're coming from a little bit of an inferior competition, that doesn't just automatically translate that you're not going to be effective once you you know, once you know get to the SEC playing in Power 4 football. So yeah, I think Cade Muller is a guy, especially at the edge position. Oklahoma has got to be able to get back to you know, consistently having a guy out on the edge that can be a difference maker. You know, we, we've we've seen what it looks like, you know, whether it's a, an Eric Stryker, an Oboe, um, you know, a, uh, a Nick Benito, Oklahoma, especially, again, I feel like this is a phrase that we're going to be using for the next six months going into the SEC where you're going to have first round tackles, um, you know, that you're going to be facing every other week. You've got to be able to find a couple of guys that can get after the passer, that can, you know, set the edge, that can make a play on third and seven to, you know, to get the defense off of the field. I know that there's a lot of quality guys that are, you know, in that same position room as Caden, you know, whether it's an Ethan Downs, an R. Mason Thomas, a PJ Adebaware, but Caden Willard, make no mistake about it, he has the, he's got the skill set. Um, he's got all of the characteristics that you would look for in a quality. I'm not, I'm not going to go as far as to say elite, but he's a guy that can be a difference maker this upcoming fall for Oklahoma. And from, from what we've heard, Caden's been a guy that's really stood out so far um, uh, the first few days of practice. 
Something that makes it so much easier for those guys on the edge is someone on the interior that can command those double teams, be disruptive. Sure. And the guy that fits that bill so far uh, out of all the spring practices, I think there's been only a couple is Jaden Jackson. And uh, Tyler, I'll, I'll give you a second here. Just gush on Jaden Jackson and what he's bringing to this defense this year. Oh, it's, it's absolutely huge. And especially, you know, going, going into a season where, you know, you're not going to have Jordan Kelly, you've lost some guys to graduation. You've lost some guys to the NFL, like an Isaiah Coe, Jacob Lacey having to medically retire. You know, there's a lot of pressure on a guy like Dejon Terry coming back to, you know, really, you know, not just be able to stay healthy for a full season, but, you know, he's got a lot on his plate, but the fact that you were able to bring in a guy from IMG Academy and a guy in Jane Jackson, who's already, you know, six foot three, six foot four, he's going to be well over 300 pounds by the time the season gets going. He's a guy that has the skill set. He's got the motor. He plays with that nasty, you know, that grit, hard nosed football uh, mindset that we've seen from some, you know, really quality defensive linemen. And I know that he's a true freshman. You ideally would not want to have to rely on a true freshman on the defensive line in the SEC, but. Make no mistake about it, whether it's David Stone or Jane Jackson, who, you know, you listen to what Todd Bates has been able to say, you, th you know, you hear from some of the guys on staff, they're raving about what Jane's been able to do in such a short amount of time since he's been on campus. So I don't care if the guy's a true freshman, he's going to have the opportunity uh, to find himself into that top two, three rotation. You're going to see Jane Jackson making a handful of plays this upcoming fall um, and make no mistake about it. Wouldn't surprise me if he starts um, maybe come OU Texas time. I wouldn't surprise me if he's starting by like game one, honestly. I think he just approaches everything with a lot of professionalism. He seems uh, mature beyond his years as a Absolutely. true freshman. So I, I really like what I've heard and seen out of him so far. And I, obviously the coaches are, are loving what they're seeing out of him in spring practice. It might be a little bit too premature to do this, but I kind of feel like I feel like we need a new nickname or we need a nickname for Jane Jackson. I thought that'd be a good one for the comments. If people have ideas, want to drop those in there. Let us know. Like, I feel like J Jack is kind of like, uh. so I, I don't know. I'm, I'm curious what people have. I think there's a lot of different ways you could go with a nickname there. I would love to hear it in the comments if people have any, but um, I, I think he's a guy that's definitely going to be uh, making some waves. And we saw a lot of uh, clips in there in the highlights that we just played on YouTube where he's right alongside David Stone. And that's a two-man wrecking crew. They know how to play together. Um, so I, obviously, like they're freshmen, <laughs> there's always that caveat. But, yeah. I mean, if you continue to make noise in practice, I know they're not going up against the world's greatest offensive line. I think they're still going to be solid this year. But that's still something to worth note, you know, worth noting about as far as true freshmen there, they seem to be up to the billing of everything that we've wanted them to be so mm -hmm. far. Well, Adam, I think that, and again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I know that we've spent, you know, the last two or three months talking about, you know, the offensive line and the defensive line, how that, those are the two biggest question marks on the team. And those are the two position groups going into the SEC that you absolutely do not want to, do not want to have them be a liability to your football team, just because the SEC, you're going to get exposed week in and week out playing that type of schedule against those quality opponents over the course of, you know, a 12, 13 game season. But I think that what's got, what's got to give fans a lot of encouragement, you know, Adam's optimism here is the fact that when you when you look up and down this roster, you look at the other position groups, you know, you you look at what Jackson Arnold's got at quarterback. You've got you look at what a healthy Demarco Murray's uh, running back room, what that looks like right now. Emmett Jones, what he's done in that wide receiver core, you know, it's it's got the potential to be a top three, top four unit in all of college football, and we haven't even talked about what we've seen. You know, over the last you know couple of days of spring practice, um, you know, ta talking about how this this tight end room has absolutely transformed overnight with Bauer Sharp, with Devon yeah. Mitchell, with Jake Roberts. I mean, you know, they they put the highlight for uh, the highlight out for a reason. You know, the pass from uh, uh, from Jackson Arnold to Bauer Sharp, Oklahoma. The tight end position is no longer, and again, it's 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 March twenty sixth. So take it with a grain of salt, but you can just watch the way how these guys look in a uniform. You can watch how they move, you know, how they block, how they run routes, how they are with the ball in their hands. The, the tight end position is no longer a liability, for lack of a better word. I think that this is going to be a position group that's really going to allow Oklahoma to really kind of max out what they're able to do offensively next year because they got the QB, they got the running backs, they got the wide receivers out wide. Now you've got a now you've got a tight end group that really has the opportunity to kind of take you to that next level, and you just hope that the offensive line can kind of hold up their end of the bargain. Because if you're able to give Jackson Arnold time with the weapons and the skilled players that he's got around him, um, I would expect that scoreboard to be uh, lit up uh, early and often for Oklahoma next season. 
course, we're going to be talking a lot more football as things go, but we need to cover some spring sports, uh, women's basketball, which just ended. But uh, before we do that, Tyler, I want to tell everyone about our sponsor here at the Mainline, and that is Prize Picks. Uh, you know, football yeah. season still a few months away, but March Madness is heating up. We just finished the uh, first and second round there, and whether it's tournament season or whether you're fighting for you know playoff in the home court playoff spot in the NBA. Um, there's no shortage of high stakes basketball that's happening right now. And you can get in on the excitement with prize picks. It's America's number one fantasy sports app. It's available in 30 plus states, including Oklahoma. And you can really test out your hoops knowledge uh, by yeah. playing some really fun contests that they have there. Uh, they've even got weekly promotions that can lead to some pretty big payouts like Taco Tuesday. Uh, we record on Tuesdays. We go live on Tuesdays. So every Tuesday, prize picks has some uh, really cool specials that you guys can use where you can get discounts on uh, mm. certain player projections, get uh, up to 25 percent off to get even more value out of uh, everything that you're doing there at prize picks so uh, make sure you download the app today and they're giving you the ability to uh, download that app and use code mainline for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars uh, they are linked in our show notes uh, so we appreciate prize picks for sponsoring the show let's yeah. talk a little bit about women's basketball here though they just had their season ended last night against indiana in the second round of the ncaa <laughs> tournament didn't quite make that sweet 16 uh, seeding that or that uh, position that we wanted them to. They obviously weren't the favorites there at the five seed, um, but they played their tails off there. And I think overall, we still feel really satisfied with what we're getting out of women's basketball. More than satisfied with what you're getting from Ginny Baranchek. You know, three seasons as the head coach in Norman, Oklahoma, two, two consecutive Big 12 championships. I know that they failed to reach the Sweet 16 for the first time since 2013. So, well, you know, well over a decade now that Oklahoma's failed to reach that second weekend in March. But, you know, make no mistake about it, Adam. This this was an extremely tough draw for Oklahoma. Even though you go on and you win the Big 12 Conference, you still, you know, were slated against uh, at a at a five seed going up against a Florida Gulf Coast team that was probably one of the better higher seeds in the history of of March Madness. When you look at well mm -hmm. uh, of how accomplished they were uh, over the course of their regular season, you figured out a way to kind of come back uh, against Florida Gulf Coast. You figure out a way to you know advance to the second game, and then. Kind of what do you inherit? You got to go into Bloomington, into Bloomington against twelve thousand uh, Indiana fans against a four seeded Indiana that was a perfect sixteen and zero on their home floor this year. And you know, Adam, it was one of the better women's college basketball games that I've had a chance to watch in a long, long time. Oklahoma came out; they were on fire. They really took it to uh, Indiana for for the course of four quarters. And you know, really, Adam. It was kind of a it was kind of Oklahoma's game up until the final minute and a half where you know they just kind of picked the wrong time to you know force a couple of uh, uh, you know have a bad couple of possessions a couple of turnovers they really weren't able to you know kind of capitalize in back to back possessions in terms of you know rebounding the basketball giving up a few bunnies uh, down on the opposite end they were outscored eleven to four in the final minute and eighteen seconds after being tied with Indiana so but again. Make no mistake about it, phenomenal season for Oklahoma. You would have liked to advance to the Sweet 16, but even though Indiana did get this win, they they kind of have to they kind of have a tough uh, tough road ahead of them. They've got to play the number one overall team in South Carolina next weekend. So it wouldn't have gotten any easier for Oklahoma if they were able to you know knock off the Hoosiers. But this is a fantastic season for Oklahoma, um, and you know th this has got to give Oklahoma fans. Going into next season, not just a ton of optimism and a ton of excitement about the direction that Ginny Baranchek's team, uh, or Ginny Baranchek has got this program moving forward. We wish that there was another program that shared the LNC that was on a similar trajectory. <laughs> I kind of think we talked about that, you know, in length last week. But make no mistake about it, as good as this this uh, basketball team is going to be going forward with what they've got coming back a season from now, and obviously we'll have to see what happens with the transfer portal, but you're only losing a couple of players that really didn't play that much uh, this season, so you're going to bring back a lot of really quality pieces that you know were responsible for a huge amount of your production over the course of this season. So even though it does sting right now, you, you, know, you were a couple of plays away from playing in the Sweet 16, but make no mistake about it, Jenny Baranchek's crew, with what her and that coaching staff have done with this basketball program since the final year of Sherry Cole, um, I couldn't be more excited, couldn't be more proud, and you know, couldn't be more optimistic about the direction of Oklahoma women's basketball uh, going into the SEC in 2025. Yeah, I've, I've seen some people a little upset that we're not already in the Final Four. It's, it's year three of Jenny Baranchek. I think there's a lot of roster flipping that is still going on not to disrespect any players that are currently on there i think there's some really good building blocks in peyton verholst in sahara williams that are coming back next year but 
Um, I think there's still I think there's still some building of this roster into that Final Four type of team that we were used to a decade, 15 years ago. You've seen people out there on social media that are disappointed that this isn't a Final Four team? <laughs> not not specifically that they didn't make the Final Four, that they were expecting them to make the Final Four, but that feeling that, oh, a second round exit is disappointing. I, you know, there's always going to be some crazy people out there. I, they play a fun mm -hmm. style of basketball. They're incredibly exciting to watch. They can beat, I think, almost everybody, but like the top two or three teams in a mm -hmm. given year. They can also lose to some bad teams. We saw that early on in the season against mm -hmm. Southern, but overall yeah. they're exciting. They're fun to watch. I think they're a program that OU can be really proud of. And in the grand scheme of things, athletic departments and schools are not measured by how good your women's basketball program is. So if they are continually out in the second round, but they're fun to watch, like I'm okay with that. I can go in a regular season game, turn on the TV, yeah. go down the Lloyd Noble Center and know that I'm going to see something exciting out of this basketball program. And that's, that's all that women's basketball needs to be, in my opinion. Women's basketball... OU went into a hostile environment yesterday, 12,000 fans in the arena against an Indiana team that was perfect on their home court. Oklahoma shot less than 25% from beyond the arc. They lost the foul battle 25-13, to 13, and they still should have won that basketball game yesterday. So, again, I know you can be disappointed. We're obviously disappointed because there's been so much momentum. You can see what Jenny is doing, the positive trajectory of this basketball program. But make no mistake about it, they've got this program going in the right direction. You give them the opportunity to continue to recruit, to continue to develop going into the SEC next year. Sky's the limit for this basketball team. They're not going to get to, you know, they're, they're not going to turn into the next, you know, South Carolina or, or LSU or even UConn, who I know that they've fallen off a little bit. But make no mistake about it, this is going to be a program that I think as long as Jenny Bronchek is in Norman, Sweet 16 is going to be is, is going to be the goal each and every year. And I think that that's where the level of expectation is eventually going to get to uh, to be as well as they continue to recruit, continue to develop. I apologize. The Amazon driver is here. So the dog's making a little bit of noise, but couldn't be more happy with what Jenny's doing. And I'm excited about what this basketball program is going to continue to do in the years ahead. Moving north a few hundred yards to Love's Field. OU hosted Baylor this past weekend uh, for two games in Norman, one game in Oklahoma City. I mentioned last week I was really curious to see what the attendance looked like for the Game Hall of Fame Stadium. OU fans yeah. showed out. That was incredible. Yes. I didn't think there was a whole lot of buzz necessarily about that specific game being in uh, in Oklahoma City, but um, I guess I was I was wrong on that. Uh, OU fans it's really the, turned out in number. It was awesome. It's the best fan base in the, at the school. And I know football's king, but softball, it's the best fan base for, of any sport. On it's the also the campus. easiest sport to be a fan of um, in, in right. OU right now. So, I mean, well, I it's, mean it's, I, I get <laughs> it's not like there's challenges it. there. Yeah. But you yeah. and I both... You and I both know, though, from our time, you know, working back in the athletic department on a t on a t on a Tuesday night, six o'clock tip off or six yeah. o'clock first pitch, you know, against Missouri Southern, whatever. I mean, they're out there tailgating two or three, you know, two or three hours beforehand. So the fan base yeah. is incredible. I, I don't have too much to take away from this, Adam. I got a couple of, you know, kind of statistics, a couple of tidbits here. You know, congratulations to Alana Torres, Big 12 Player of the Week. Anytime that you hit four home runs and double-digit RBIs over the course of four games, you're doing something right. So a uh, huge shout-out to her. Fantastic accomplishment. It's it's good to see her get the opportunities, you know, in the batter's boxes. If she keeps hitting like this, you know, she's going to work her way to where she's an everyday position player, uh, you know, t type of, uh, you know, athlete on the softball team. And then, Adam, Adam, 31 and 1, 9 and 0 in the Big 12. This was the stat that, st uh, that stuck out the most to me. Oklahoma's played nine Big 12 games. They've outscored their opponents in those nine games, 96 to 14. First in <laughs> first in batting average as a team, top five in ERA as a pitching staff. Anytime that you're able to stay within that top five in both of those categories, you're doing something right. Um, Patty Gasso, she pushes all the right buttons. She's got this team playing really, really good softball right now. Yeah, I think Torres really working her way into the lineup and saying, yeah, you can't take me out of the lineup is, is really what this team needs. Pair mm -hmm. that with Sydney Saunders, Sanders really excelling. I do the same thing you do. I always want to say Saunders for, for yeah. Sydney Sanders there. I don't know why, but um, yeah, she, she's obviously had a great march. Uh, we're going to talk about her, her home run numbers here in a second. But yeah, it's I think from a hitting perspective, the team is really rounding into form. They've kind of got that. I didn't know that they had it early on in the year, but I'm starting to feel it now where it's like, yeah, they don't have any runs by the time the third in inning is coming around, but you can just feel the other team is nervous. Like, are we about to give up yeah. nine runs in a single inning um, against Oklahoma? And it kind of feels like, okay, I, I feel comfortable with where mm -hmm. things are moving there. Obviously I'm nitpicking because the team is excellent, but 
I'm feeling really good about where we're going offensively. Defensively, well, it, I don't know yet, but again, nitpicky. It, it's it's probably the deepest lineup that I've seen from Oklahoma since we've you know real really started paying attention to softball you know over the last you know five to ten years. But I mean, the the thing that is so crazy about Alana Torres is when you look at the pr- the production that she's done over the last couple of weeks of the season. The hard part about it is for her is you know who do you pull out of the lineup to replace her? I mean, I know that in the fact Adam is ninety six to fourteen outscoring their Big Twelve opponents. They've done most of this without even having Kinsey Hansen in the lineup as well. But you know when you've got so much good depth top to bottom. I mean, you know we're, we're we go through, it seems like each of these episodes uh, since we started softball season, we're not even talking about Tiari. We're not even talking about Jada. Alyssa Brito, probably the best player on this uh, in this lineup right now with what she's done player from start of the to year. Player of the player year. Player of the year. <laughs> friend, of, friend, of, friend of the podcast. But yeah, I mean, there's just, there's so many weapons uh, up and down this lineup for Patty Gasso that you can, you know, Patty kind of said it best going into the preseason when talking about, you know, the level of expectation for, for, you know, the every single player on this roster where, you know, there's, there's no such thing as an inflated ego. All of these girls are extremely down to earth and Patty's flat out told these people flat out told her, her players, I don't care if you're Jada Coleman or Tiari Jennings, we're going to win with you, but I can also sit you on the bench and put plug somebody else in and we're not going to miss a beat. So it's a good problem to have as a head coach. And it's, it's good to see that the, you know, the championship mindset, the culture that Patty Gasso has instilled in this program over the last, you know, 30 plus years. I mean, it's just, it's, it's next man up mentality. And, you know, even though the roster and the lineups change, the expectations don't and the level of production that we're starting to see out of this lineup, I mean, it's it it rivals what we've seen from the last you know four to five seasons in Norman, and I think it's only going to get better. But even though you've got the upcoming uh, you know back to back road weekends in the Big Twelve, you know you've got to go to Lawrence this weekend. Then the much anticipated showdown in Austin for Red River rivalry, you know that's going to be a top two, maybe top three matchup down there in Austin. And I think that that's one that many people have circled, uh, not just in the Big Twelve, not just in Norman or Austin. But many, many fans across you know the landscape of college football in the or college softball uh, in, in the United States. Yeah, Tyler. Before the season, we took some bold predictions from fans. We entered some ourselves for softball. I thought it'd be fun to kind of revisit them. We're roughly uh, halfway through the season right now. I picked two from fans that submitted them to us, and then I picked the two that uh, we did as well. I thought it'd be cool to revisit them. Yeah. I'm going to go with uh, Sooner Born OKU. They said three out of the top 10 home run leaders will be Sooners. And to track currently right now, I thought this was a pretty good one. It's bold, but very doable. Uh, Alyssa Brito and Tiara Jennings tied at number seven nationally with 12 home runs. And then Sid Sanders uh, just behind them tied at 24 with 10. There's a lot of players grouped in there tied at seven, tied Mm -hmm. at, at 10. Uh, but it's something that I think will will sort out over time. But I think OU's kind of in a in a good direction there. No Kinsey Hansen really in this conversation. She's been out with injury, uh, you know, here and there. So uh, she just doesn't have the consistency of being in the lineup. But I think if she was playing every game, she'd be right up there with with that group of three. But Sid Sanders really coming on strong in the month of March to put herself in that third position. And I, I feel like there's there's definitely a really solid chance of this still working out for uh, Sooner Born OKU. Yeah, I 1000% agree. I know that whenever we posed this question, uh, you know, on Twitter before the season started, this, you know, this uh, response from Soonerborn OKU was definitely, you know, one of the ones that I thought was going to be the most realistic, even though it is a bold prediction. When you look at the, you know, the talent up and down this lineup, I didn't think that, you know, this was going to be something that was, you know, not a realistic possibility. And it's clear, you know, through the first couple of months of the season that Oklahoma's, you know, poised uh, to be able to, you know, kind of close this thing out and lay in three in the top 10. The next one here, Adam, comes from Jessica Barnes. Barn, who says OU claims record for fielding percentage held by Tennessee at 0.988 last year. Last year's team got to 0.987. I don't think they're going to hit that this year, Adam. I don't think so. They're currently at 0.983. And the middle of this defense right now, Tiara Jennings, Avery Hodge, we've seen some other players in there as well. They've been good. Um, they haven't been perfect, which was Grace Lyons last year. Um, very underrated, I think, in some senses, or maybe even underappreciated a little bit. I think OU yeah. fans you know, love Grace. They love what she brought to the team, but we kind of got used to it a little bit that, oh, she's just going to field everything and be amazing. And now we're seeing like some people that are, are really good, but not perfect again. So uh, I'm a little bit, uh, I mean, this combined with some of the pitching not being as mm-hmm. good as last year, again, 
nitpicky. Like it's hard to complain about some really good pitching out of Kelly Maxwell, Nicole May, and, and the rest of the staff there. But this combined with the lower fielding percentage makes me a little bit nervous defensively. You know, as OU goes to Austin here in a couple of weeks, um, as they get into maybe a World Series in Oklahoma City, I, I don't think this team is out of the woods or for sure thing to make it to Oklahoma City yet. There's still a long way to go. We'll see what kind of matchups they get for a super regional mm-hmm. situation. But um, but yeah, that makes me a little nervous. But I I guess I guess I could turn things around and still hit Jessica's uh, bold prediction here of 988. We'll see. They're they're it, in the neighborhood at least. Still entirely possible. Adam, uh, next next uh, bold prediction that we're going to revisit here. This is actually something that you said prior to the start of the year. I didn't think it was the most off the wall, you know, circus type of take, but this is something that you know Oklahoma has achieved so far, and that is the Sooners averaging at least two home runs a game. Um, nicely done, my friend. Yeah, so far, so good. Now, I know a lot of that is from non-conference play, and maybe that number will come down a bit right now. They're averaging 2.12 home runs per game. I predicted two, so they're currently over that. We'll see if that continues. I think Sid Sanders has helped me out a lot. Uh, Alina Torres has helped me out a lot mm-hmm. here over this past weekend. Uh, even Riley Boone's gotten in on the action occasionally here and there. Yeah, um, I'd like to see Jada Coleman join the party a little bit more frequently, mm-hmm. but... Overall, like I think my bold prediction is in good shape. Still not as good as the number one team in the country, which is Miami of Ohio, who we saw here in Norman just a couple weeks ago. Uh, they're averaging 2.75 home runs a game, which is pretty crazy. Uh, but I feel decent about my prediction right now for Oklahoma to average two home runs per game, which is kind of crazy to think about. Like that's that's the most exciting play in the entire sport, and you get two of them a game. Like uh, that's pretty special from this club. Which brings us, I guess, to your bold prediction which you seem you look a little skeptical about right now, but I don't think it was a bad one. I don't think it was a bad one. I made the prediction before the end of the year or before the start of the year that Oklahoma's pitching staff would throw more perfect games than the Sooners would have losses. We've got one loss. We've got no perfect games. And I know that, you know, Kelly Maxwell, she did throw the no hitter, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. The pitching hasn't been as dominant as what we've seen, you know, from Oklahoma. They don't have, and again, I I hate to even throw the name out there, but uh, they don't have a Jordy Ball. They don't have a Paige Parker. And as good as Kelly Maxwell and Nicole May are, I just don't think that they have a, they don't have a person that you can realistically sit there and say, you know, we can throw her out there and she's going to, you know, she's going to shut whoever we're playing, uh, you know, in the Women's College World Series final. Obviously, you know, they're going to get better. You know, Jen Rocha, she's done a tremendous job with this pitching staff. And we haven't even talked about how good of a job, you know, Kirsten Deal and Peyton Monticelli have done, you know, during their brief appearances, you know, in the circle for Oklahoma. But I don't, I don't, this one's definitely, you know, not out of the woods yet. This is still something that's realistically possible. Uh, so we'll revisit this once we get a little bit closer uh, towards the month of May. Yeah, you would think that hopefully they would have a little bit of a lead on perfect games in the non-conference slate because now they're in conference. You're probably not going to get that against Texas or Oklahoma State. Yeah. Um, you already played a tough team in Baylor, couldn't get it there. Um, I I don't think that they're going to do it against Kansas. They're pretty solid. They're ranked. Texas, you play BYU at home. Maybe that's the opportunity to do it. And you do have some midweek games mixed in there, but those are against typically pretty solid programs like Wichita State, Tulsa. Um, mm-hmm. So I... I don't know if there's too many opportunities for that to happen. You already have one loss in the books, but I think it was a worthy prediction to put out there. Uh, bold, mm-hmm. um, definitely challenging, but um, not a bad prediction by any means. Let's move to baseball uh, and yeah. talk a little bit about what's going on there. We aren't doing Adam's optimism, so that should tell you something right off the bat about how I feel about this team, and that's kind of a little bit, I guess, tongue-in-cheek in in the sense that we only do Adam's optimism when I'm not really optimistic about baseball to force me to be a little optimistic, but we're not doing that tonight, despite a week where things didn't go exactly the way OU wanted them to, but I think think you can still feel pretty solid about this baseball team. You go from Love's Field down the street to the Dale. Oklahoma climbed all the way up to number 14 in the rankings before the start of play last week. They lose the midweek game to Dallas Baptist. And then, Adam, you throw a no-hitter on Friday night. Fantastic performance by the OU pitching staff, but then you're not able to you know, win one of those final two games to take the series against West Virginia. So talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the performance of Skip's bunch last week and you know, kind of your outlook on this baseball program one week further into the season. Yeah, we talked last week about how the midweek games, you don't take as much value out of that because it's one matchup with probably your fourth 
or fifth or even sixth best pitcher starting that game. We saw the bullpen game against Dallas Baptist where Skip put a new pitcher in every inning. It was it was pretty wild. And they're a solid ball club, so you know they're going to bring it on Tuesday night. Those games are always yeah. wild. You put more stock in what's happening on the weekend, and you start off things really well with a combined no-hitter between uh, Braden Davis and Reed uh, and, and Reed Hensley there. But, you know, I, it's, it's frustrating when you get a no-hitter on Friday, and then Saturday, you know, you do the doubleheader. You know, the first game... Yeah, you lose it. It's fine. Sometimes you don't always have it. But then you turn around the next game and you get a pitcher that's going to go 12 strikeouts across eight plus innings there in, in Kyson Witherspoon. Absolutely excellent performance out of him. But right before that, Jamie Hitt is just left in to, to dry out there, giving up six runs across four home runs uh, to West Virginia very early on in, in less than four outs um, to, to start the game. Just put your team in a hole, and OU was battling back the entire game out of that hole, and it's it's frustrating. I think it's led to the point where we talked about this last week where Kyson Witherspoon was really a weapon out of the bullpen and was something that was really unique that other teams really didn't couldn't really compete with that, but now it's gone to needs to be the starter. Skip announced he would be a starter this upcoming weekend against Lamar, an out-of-conference mm. series, a ball club from the Southland that – uh, they're playing currently as we speak against Houston, but they're on a 13-game winning streak. They're the number one team out of the Southland Conference, so they're solid. They're still a team OU, I think, can and should sweep. Uh, but now Kyson Witherspoon probably moves into one of those starter roles, likely day three, which this weekend being Easter, that'll be Saturday. And I think he eventually just stays on that Saturday rotation, and Brendan Gurton probably moves into a Sunday starter position. Um, so a little bit of shifting there, but I think Kyson is – is still the best pitcher on this team. And now we can get even more pitches out of him as a starter. Adam, one of the things that a head coach and a, and a you know, even the entire staff hopes that, you know, never shows its ugly head and that's the injury bug. And we're starting to see, you know, a handful of injuries start to pile up for this Oklahoma baseball team. Where are we at right now in terms of the overall health of this team? And uh, you know, whether it's Spikerman or, you know, what are, how soon can Oklahoma fans expect, you know, some of these guys to return to the lineup? And, you know, what's Oklahoma going to have to do to kind of, you know, make up for the lack of production, losing some of these guys that are, you know, been, a, you know, key contributors for them through the first couple months of the season? Yeah, I think we desperately miss Spikerman at the plate, obviously hitting 394 on the season. He's going to be out at least another three weeks. I think it'll probably be longer than that. And Jason Walk has been... Uh, hasn't had any mishaps in the field on the defensive side of the ball. He's he's kind of entertaining to watch out there in center <laughs> field because I think he's I think he's a little nervous, you know, calling other guys off or calling them off when really you know he should defer to them. Uh, but he's got so much speed he can make up for all his mistakes. So um, nothing terrible's happened there as of right now. It's really his approach at the plate. He's he's struck out looking quite a few times. I, he's not completely comfortable there he's a certainly a weapon if you can get him on base because his speed is is impressive i know he hit a double earlier tonight against royal roberts uh, but i you know you're, you're not seeing very much production from the back end of that lineup there when uh, you've got jason walk you've got scott mudler uh he's he's been good um he's been a nice addition out of that catcher position but he's still at the back of the lineup for a reason um uh, you're gonna see rocco garza gongora at the back of the lineup jackson willits at the back of the lineup uh, isaiah lane when he's playing third base at the back mm -hmm. of the lineup and we're not seeing we're seeing some good at bats, but not enough consistency to where we can go. Okay. Like they're going to flip the lineup over for us and we can start getting back into our, our really heavy hitters that have been excellent, like Bryce Madrin, Michael Snyder and so forth. And then the guys that are kind of that hinge part of the lineup, like Anthony McKenzie and Jackson Nicholas have had really good stretches of the year. Uh, Jackson Nicholas didn't have his best weekend against West Virginia and Anthony McKenzie has been a little bit of a dip right now. Um, but if, if those guys can start to, um, really come back and forth. I think we really need some other guys to really step up and contribute with um, Spikerman out, of course, and then Carter Frederick with his broken finger that happened mm -hmm. off that line drive into the dugout and batting practice. Uh, haven't heard any word necessarily on when he'll be back. So definitely need some other guys to step up. I'm looking for Jackson Nicholas and Anthony McKenzie mm -hmm. really to get back in a groove. You get a break in the action from Big 12 play. You've got a big, important upcoming series this weekend. What's Oklahoma have on deck? What should our expectations be for this ball club going into this weekend? I think it's reasonable to to look for a sweep here. Winning two out of three would be worst case scenario. If you win one out of three or even get swept, terrible. Uh, we'll, we'll bring back Adam's optimism for sure if that happens against Lamar. Uh, they're playing right now against Oral Roberts, so most people will listen to this after that game's completed. I think OU's got a 4-0 lead as we record right now. 
if they can hold on to that, that's a solid win. Oral Roberts went to the Omaha last year. They're not the same ball club. Their RPI is much lower than that. So I think this is kind of a, a category of there's not really a must win in baseball, but you don't want to damage that RPI too much. We're still in the top 15, still in the top five in terms of uh, strength of schedule. So, you know, get through this week, get right against Lamar, get a nice sweep and play there because the following week, you're hosting Oklahoma State at home. A uh, huge matchup, an opportunity, I think, for OU to really show off some of their better pitchers that are, you know, not in the midweek game where who knows what might happen against Oklahoma State. Win that series. Uh, actually, it's not at home. It's in uh, Stillwater, I should mention. But mm-hmm. go to O'Brate, win a series there uh, in your, your last year in the Big 12 so we can at least hold mm-hmm. that over the uh, Poke fans. Midweek wins are a possibility for Oklahoma as long as they're not playing Dallas Baptist or Oklahoma <laughs> State. So, uh, well, good, good stuff, Adam. Obviously, you know, a lot of the attention is being put on softball, but I think that, you know, with what baseball has been able to do through the first couple months of the season, you know, they've, you know, they've not just put Oklahoma fans on notice, but I think that they put fans across the, you know, the world of college baseball. Top 25. Top 25, you know, so this is going to yeah. be a fun program to watch and we'll see if they can, you know, kind of get back on track a little bit this weekend against Lamar uh, before we kind of move into the back half of the Big 12 schedule going forward. So, Adam, that's all I got. Get us out of here. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for listening or watching the main line this week. We will see everybody next week for the next episode.